This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. Russian President Vladimir Putin said that there is no evidence that Iran is trying to produce nuclear weapons. After Putin held talks with his French counterpart Nicolas Sarkozy in Moscow, he told the press that Russia agrees with the position of Western nations that Iran's nuclear program must be transparent. He said that his country is basing their handling of the issue on the principle that there is no Iranian plan to produce nuclear weapons. There are many topics up for discussion at the Russian-French summit in Moscow. However, the Iranian nuclear program is the most prominent point of difference between the two sides. France, ever since Sarkozy came to power, has taken a strong position towards Iran's nuclear program, calling on Tehran to abandon its nuclear ambitions and by placing pressure on Iran to do so. However, Moscow continues to oppose imposing more sanctions on Iran. We do not have information that Iran is trying to produce nuclear weapons. We do not have such objective data. Thus, we operate on the principle that Iran does not have these plans. Iran must be encouraged to make its nuclear program transparent. There are other points of difference on the negotiating table, including the future of the region of Kosovo. Paris has taken a position in line with the European Union and the United States, which are all calling for the region to be independent. However, Moscow absolutely rejects such a call and has threatened to use the veto power against any resolution in the Security Council that attempts to do this. Although Sarkozy has criticized Moscow, accusing it of complicating world affairs rather than solving them, and has said that it is falling short of implementing democracy, Moscow views Sarkozy's visit as a good opportunity to get clarification on the position of France's new leader on many international issues, especially their closeness with Washington. I am a friend of the United States, but that does not mean a vessel. I have disagreements with the United States. One can love all members of his family, but not agree with them on everything. Despite Moscow's concern over the close relationship between America and France, it placed great importance on Sarkozy's visit, especially since both countries have mutual interests, particularly in terms of the economy which both are trying to raise to a strategic level. President Ahmadinejad told the crowd of students on Wednesday Iran will not bend to foreign pressures and is determined to fully claim its own nuclear rights. He added bullying powers are making ballyhoo against Iran, but that they fail to harm the country. The president said Iran has successfully completed the nuclear fuel cycle over the past two years. Ahmadinejad said the Iranian nation is ready to enter talks on any question that is out of that is of global concern, but that does not mean it will compromise its absolute rights. He went on to say that major powers need to let Iran's nuclear case go back to the only competent body, the IAEA, something which could save their face to some extent. Parliamentarians from 130 countries are calling for the immediate release of Palestinian MPs captured by the Zionist regime of Israel. On the closing day of the 117th session of the Interparliamentary Union, the participants issued five statements based on their report of the Human Rights Committee and criticized Israel, Israeli officials for not cooperating with the Union, which has time and again expressed concern 
about the medical health and life condition of the detained Palestinian MPs. The IPU resolutions have also voiced protest over the Zionist regime's denial of legal representation and family visit to the detained Palestinian MPs. Forty Palestinian MPs, among them Parliament Speaker Abdul Aziz Dawaik, are held in Israeli detention for over 18 months. The second round of technical talks between Iran and the IAEA officials on the P-1 and P-2 centrifuges began on Wednesday. The first round of talks Tuesday was co-chaired by SNSC Deputy Secretary for International Affairs Javad Vaidi and Deputy IAEA Chief for Safeguards Ali Heinonen. Informed sources said during the present round of talks, which would last until Thursday, the Iranian side would present written responses to several questions put forward by the IAEA on the P-1 and P-2 centrifuges in August. Iran's responses would be followed up in another meeting between the two sides, expected to be held in mid-October. The agency would then have until mid-October to study the responses and raise new points, if any. Likely, closure, that is likely closure of the centrifuges P1 and P2 cases, would open discussion on the subject of contamination. Russian President Vladimir Putin refused to bend to Western pressures over Iran, saying after talks with French President Nicolas Sarkozy that he does not believe Iran is trying to build a nuclear bomb. Speaking at a joint press conference with his French counterpart, President Putin further said Iran's nuclear program is absolutely transparent and Moscow sticks to the principle that Iran is far from creating a nuclear weapon. The disaster in Iraq and of Iraqis has become a reality that many people in the world are trying to ignore. The issue of Iraqi refugees has caused a crisis that seems to grow in its complexity with time. Ramadan has indeed opened the wounds of many Iraqi refugees, with some hoping to celebrate the holy month next year in their homes and among their loved ones. Salwa al-Sawalika talked to some of the displaced refugees and compiled the following report from Amman. The displaced family of Abu Hussein is living in this rundown shed. The family was forced to migrate to Jordan due to the deteriorating security situation in Iraq. The Abu Hussein family, which includes six members, has no source of income. Abu Hussein, the head of the household, doesn't have permanent resident status in Jordan, meaning that he is confined to his house. The home from the inside doesn't seem to protect its occupants from the cold. In fact, Abu Hussein's home is in worse shape than that of a poor family's. Frankly, I borrow money from other Iraqi refugees to make ends meet. What else can I do? I do not have a job. Inside the family's home, the simple look of the kitchen showed the deteriorating living conditions which the Abu Hussein family is subjected to. This iftar buffet was made possible by the generous donations of neighbors or perhaps was paid for by a loan. The Abu Hussein family is hoping that they will celebrate Ramadan next year in Iraq. It's different in Iraq. We would be with our relatives and loved ones. However, we're living here in a foreign country and separated from our Iraqi relatives. It's hard on us, especially during the month of Ramadan. Meanwhile, Abu Hussein's 12-year-old Zainab continues to hold on to her dream that one day she will be able to return home and reunite with her relatives. We love to celebrate Ramadan in Iraq because all of our relatives and loved ones are there. We don't have any relatives in Jordan. Many displaced Iraqi families share similar conditions to those experienced by the Abu Hussein family. A large number of Iraqi families in Jordan are living under harsh economic conditions due to low incomes and a lack of financial support. They were not only alienated from their homeland and separated from their loved ones, but they were also denied residency status by their hosting country. This is the case for most Iraqi displaced families living in Jordan, where many wish to spend one day of Ramadan at their own homes and to eat iftar with their loved loved ones again.
Vice President Tariq Al Hashimi visited one of the Interior Ministry's women prison facilities. Two female parliament members, Umm Al Qadi and Azhar Al Samara, accompanied him. They inspected the living conditions of the women at the prison and met with several female prisoners as they listened to their complaints about the prison. Some explained that they were arrested for reasons that were ambiguous, while others said that they were arrested in the street, although there were no charges brought against them. Another group said that they were arrested and brought in as hostages until their husbands surrendered themselves to the authorities. Is the situation faced by Iraqi women prisoners an acceptable one by the democratically elected Iraqi government and the Muslim Prime Minister Nur al-Maliki? They told me to come and visit my son. When I came, they put me in a female prison facility in al qadamiya they sentenced me to life in prison, despite the fact that no one came forward to complain about me or to testify against me. I did not commit any crimes. They accused me of wiping the blood off a victim that I didn't even know. I didn't know the victim or the perpetrator. It took them only 10 minutes to sentence me to a lifetime in prison. They have no evidence. Where is the victim? I do not know where he is. They didn't even tell you where the body of the victim was? Yes, I don't know where the body was. My daughter is a university student, but they brought both of us here. Where is your daughter? She is with me in prison. Why was she imprisoned here? Was she sentenced? Yes, she received a life sentence too. She got married only one month ago. Where are you from? I'm originally from Mansura, but I've been living in Al-Mariya for two years. They told me to come and visit my son, but when I went, they put me in prison instead. I do not know what happened to my son. About one year ago, they told me that my son was killed while being tortured. I did not do anything. My husband was the primary defendant. They killed my husband and I remained in prison. He was charged with terrorism. The men who killed my husband were in the courtroom, but I was not allowed to speak to them. The first one testified and the second one was sitting down. I swear to God that I'm innocent. I have faced incredible injustices, which leads me to believe that all of the women here are innocent. The judges do not even look into our cases. They just read and accept the sentences that the police officers write for them. One of the female prisoners said that she was arrested in the place of her husband. She was sentenced to death only because her husband was not at home when the raid happened. He was sentenced to death seven months ago. Were you his partner? No, they arrested me because they could not find him. They told me that I will not be released until he comes forward. When I complained, I received a document saying that I was sentenced to death. What was the date of the document? The document was dated February 21st. Parliament member Amal Al-Qadi said that most of the prisoners have been in jail for several months and even years without a court hearing. I represent a committee in the Iraqi parliament. I came to inspect the living conditions here. The prison facility is bad and needs immediate renovations. Many of the prisoners are put together in the same cell. Some are facing death sentences while others face heavy sentences. There are many women who have been detained without an investigation. One female prisoner has been detained for four years without an investigation or court hearing. The female prisoners also complain because they are not allowed to see the sun. Some do not see the sun for one or two months. There is a severe shortage of medicine inside the prison. Two women died because they did not receive any medical attention. One died of diabetes and the other of cancer. They were not seen by specialists and did not receive any medicine. They were also not sent to a specialized hospital.
تشتهر مدينة الموصل بصناعة الحلويات الفاخرة. The city of Mosul is known for making sweets. Their daily breakfast or iftar meals always include these special Ramadan sweets. Meanwhile, the health inspector of Mosul increased the monitoring of the manufacturers of the sweets. Arkan Athai has the details in the following report. Baklava, Zalabia, Kunafa sweets and various pastries are what the city of Mosul is known for. There is more of a demand for them during the blessed month of Ramadan. They make up what the people from Mosul consider a complete meal. This will never change among the people of the city. Orders for these sweets increase during the month of Ramadan because this is the season for them. The sweets are good, the prices are right, and thank God the season is good. But what I want most is security. The increased demand for sweets during the blessed month has led to a spread of producers and stores in Mosul, some of which are unlicensed. This has led to more work for the inspector's agency. During the month of Ramadan, we make more visits to these facilities, going more than once a month, sometimes two or three times. We always give them detailed instructions. There is a segment of this industry that works from their homes, especially during Ramadan. However, most are unlicensed. This is causing us to work harder to monitor these unlicensed workers. The licensed work is hygienic, and the permission to operate comes from our administration. Inside the factory, they display a document that shows that their factory is licensed. Therefore, whoever wants to work, we tell them to come and obtain a license to work. Whoever doesn't get a license, we tell them several times that if they don't come and get a license, we will have to close their factory. The markets are full of good things during the blessed month of Ramadan, including the sweets in all its forms and colors, whetting the appetites of the fasting people. Producers of these sweets require monitors to oversee how the sweets are made in order to guarantee the health of those who eat them. Arkan Ta'i, al Sumaria, Satellite TV, Mosul. International mediators have intensified their efforts ahead of a peace conference under the auspices of the United States. Meanwhile, the issue regarding Syria's participation and negotiations with Israel continues to stir mixed reactions. This news comes after Israel's Prime Minister Ehud Olmert refused to talk about any topic other than the Palestinian issue. In a televised interview, Syria's President Bashar al-Assad announced his conditions for the Golan Heights. During a meeting with the Turkish Foreign Minister Ali Babajan, Israel's Prime Minister Ehud Olmert rejected Syria's demands. While Syria wants the Golan issue to be treated as a main topic on the bargaining table of the International Peace Conference, Israel wants to talk only about its peace initiative for the Palestinians. Historically, negotiations between Israel and Syria over the Golan have not produced any solutions. On numerous occasions, the dispute was over an area that was no more than a few meters long. However, some Arab sources believe that the Golan issue serves as a broad headline for other outstanding issues between Damascus on one side and Tel Aviv and Washington on the other. Iraq, the Palestinian plight, Lebanon, the Iranian-Syrian alliance, and others are among the issues that the United States and Israel want Damascus to clarify. From the U.S. and Israeli points of view, solving these issues may then lead to discussions about the occupied land and the international resolutions associated with it, whereas Syria sees all of these issues as being linked. Solving the first issue may lead to solving the second, and the third issue may complicate the fourth. In the end, the goal for everyone is to reach a deal. According to events from history, the path towards a deal is filled with wars, negotiations, and sometimes surprises. Walid Saliba, Al Arabiya. Today, hundreds of Palestinians held a funeral procession for Omar Ain Boussi, an activist from the military wing of the Fatah movement who was killed by Israeli forces during a raid in Nablus in the northern West Bank. Ain Boussi was 22 years old and belonged to the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigades. 
which is affiliated with Fatah. During the clashes, the local leaders of the Al-Aqsa brigades was also injured. With Busi's death, the number of Palestinians killed has increased to 5,887 as a result of violence by the Israeli army since 2000. Police investigators today took a break in their interrogation of Prime Minister Ehud Olmert over alleged conflicts of interest in the privatization of Bank Leumi in 2005. The questioning of Olmert will resume and is expected to be completed tomorrow. Joining me now in the studio to discuss the interrogation is former government minister and law professor at Hebrew University. Shimon Shitrit. Professor Shitrit, thank you for being with us this evening. Before we talk about Omer, I want to ask you another question. What's your view on uh, whether there should be some legal limits placed on strike actions by workers in the public sectors, like the teachers, like other employees um, that have gone out on strike? Well, there are countries that have uh, limits on um, the ability of uh, public workers to engage in strikes, but it is not our tradition. Do we need? Do we need? Uh, Our tradition is to allow the workers to strike even in public service, excluding, of course, army and police. Do we need binding arbitration? Should they be forced? There, to? there is, there is arbitration, but uh, I'm not sure that all these suggestions, um, in fact, want to change the equilibrium of relationship between management and workers. Each time there is a strike, such ideas come up. I think, in order to protect the rights of the workers, there has to be the ability of the workers and the unions to strike. Otherwise, we are left in a, in a society that um, the management and the workers and the employers uh, and employers have much more power, including the government, than the, the employees. And therefore, I think what is today has to exist, except that the leaders have to be careful, to have common sense, and to use this uh, weapon, which is the last you know, the latest, the, la the last, uh, 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 last resort uh, weapon to use it scarcely and very carefully. All right, now to the problems surrounding Prime Minister Ehud Omert. Some argue that it is very disruptive to the country to launch a criminal investigation against a sitting prime minister for crimes he allegedly uh, committed before he was prime minister. Uh, you see it that way also? I think that it is not possible to carve an exception for uh, a prime minister or for um, a minister. Um, we, have on, we have immunity for the president and even that we did not respect because uh, there, was, there is an express provision in the basic law of the president that he cannot be um, accountable to, uh, before any legal procedure any court during his terms of office. Even that was not respected. So therefore the, this idea um, I think is not acceptable and even if there was a provision it would not have been respected exactly uh, the same way as it was not respected when it was in existence with regard to the president. Regarding the Winograd Commission and its investigation of the Second Lebanon War, the conduct of that war, uh, they've talked about not naming names, and that has already generated a tremendous amount of criticism. Is it good not to name names, or should they go ahead and, and uh, say, point fingers? Um, the idea of, um, uh, in fact, um, identifying personally people uh, that are responsible and secondly, not only stating the responsibility as was done in the interim report, but also to attach specific recommendation regarding whether or not they are disqualified from holding a certain office or continuing in a certain office. These are the two distinguished uh, processes. One, to make a judgment on the accountability and the responsibility of a certain person, and, and this was done already in the interim report.
The first hundred Palestinian families have returned to their homes in the Nahr al-Barid refugee camp in northern Lebanon. Most of the camp's 30,000 residents were forced to flee during weeks of intense fighting between the Lebanese army and Fatah Islam fighters. Zainal Khorad traveled to some of the families as they made the journey home. Haj Mohammed and his wife Khadra are getting ready to start their lives yet again. Displaced Palestinian refugees from the Nahr al-Barid camp this classroom has been their home since they escaped the fighting in May. The camp is the only home they have ever known. Haj Muhammad told us they are happy that they'll be going back, even if it means they will have to live in one room and among the ruins. This family is among dozens whose houses are now considered by officials safe to live in. They gathered outside the schools in the nearby Badawi refugee camp, where over half of the more than 30,000 residents of Nahr al barid took shelter from the conflict. They've endured appalling living conditions for months. Most of these refugees expect to find almost nothing left of their homes, but they are going back all the same. They hope their return will pressure the Lebanese authorities to start reconstruction in earnest. It wasn't a long journey back, just a few kilometers drive. Security measures are tight, and they will remain that way. All returnees have been given special permits. After the necessary checks, Mohammed and his family headed home. We are not able to accompany Haj Mohammed and Khadra back to their homes. The army is preventing journalists from entering the camp. It will be too chaotic, is what they told us, but they promised we'll be able to do so at a later date. Rights groups, however, were allowed in and described the camp as a wasteland. A lot of people are, are wandering around just looking completely shell-shocked. They don't know where they're going to sleep tonight. They don't know how they're going to rebuild their lives and who's going to sort of be present in that process with them. For the time being, UNRWA, which is responsible for the care of refugees, will provide them with their basic needs. We are going to a war zone, we must all appreciate that, but, uh, and we have not had enough time actually to do all the necessary repairs, but we are all in there. We have our uh, water and supply people, sanitation, uh, health, uh, uh, relief and social services. About two weeks ago, the military did allow us to film for the first time the destruction in a limited area known as the new camp. Not much was left there as a result of 15 weeks of fighting, and it is here where the dozens of displaced families return to. Back in Bedewi, thousands of other families will have to wait before they can return home. Hekmi told us her house is in the old camp area, which was completely destroyed. They tell us they will build temporary prefabricated homes soon so that we can return, she said. I hope it will be soon. It can't be soon enough for these refugees. Many of them have been displaced before, and they are now desperate to return to the one place they can call home. Zena Khudr, El Jazeera, North Lebanon. The One Nation Many Voices online film contest is calling you to pick up a camera and send us a short film about the American Muslim experience today. Up to five minutes in a variety of styles, comedy, drama, animation, music, documentary, and a special category for filmmakers 18 and under, plus a category for films less than 60 seconds. Winners receive $50,000 in prizes and a chance to show your film to millions of people on national TV through Link TV, YouTube, and on the web. Filmmakers of every age and background are encouraged to apply. Winners will be selected by celebrity judges. See the website onenationfilmcontest.org for details. The deadline is November 25th, 2007. Remember, this is One Nation, Many Voices. Stories, not stereotypes, about Muslims in America. Get more news about the Middle East online at linktv.org slash mosaic. The Mosaic webpage offers a complete archive of Mosaic programs, program transcripts, the Mosaic Video Podcast, and the Mosaic Intelligence Report, a weekly analysis of the hottest stories from the Middle East. The views expressed on Mosaic are those of the participating broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible with the support of viewers like you. Thank you.
This program was brought to you by Link TV for educational and non commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. television network devoted to global and national news with uncompromising documentaries and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.